pray together. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to your house tonight. We pray that you'd bless us as we meet together around the table of your word, and Lord, we're thankful that we can do so. Lord, thank you for giving safety to the folks who are here this evening. Lord, we pray for those who could not be with us tonight. Lord, we pray that you bring them back, and many need healing, many need answers to prayer to, to make that happen. We pray that that would take place. And Lord, we just give you the honor and praise for all that you have done and all that you will do in this service. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated and the children can be dismissed with the loggers tonight as you go out into the lobby there. Your kids can follow them downstairs for the kids program this evening. Let's get ready to sing another song tonight if we could please. All right, let's turn to page 117 and we're going to sing Living by Faith. Are you ready to sing tonight? 117 as we sing. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting confide. may blow when the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies, the master looks on at the strife. The living by faith in Jesus above, trusting can Some sweet day, our troubles will then all be o'er. The master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting can find.
Good singing tonight. Let's raise our hands tonight if we need a prayer page as they pass your row here in just a few moments, or right now, not just a few moments. They're going now. And if you need one of these tonight, make sure to get one. In a few moments, we'll go to prayer, and we'll take an opportunity uh, to look through this, uh, this prayer page tonight. We do have a missionary letter from Brother Charles Newton in East Africa, and that's on the back table back there. We'll mention him as our missionary of the week here in just a few moments. Uh, if you got to come on Sunday night for the fireworks display, then uh, we appreciate all the folks who turned out for that, and if not, maybe some of you, I know we're out of town, and we're glad to have you back in town. Uh, it's good to have some visitors with us tonight that were also here Sunday, and this is Patrick. This is Chris's friend right over here. He's looking around. That's him right there, and drove all the way up from Louisiana and uh, even barbecued the pastor some ribs today, man. So I'm, I'm telling you, he's my favorite tonight, all right? But Patrick, we're glad you and your family could be here. I know your kids are down in the, the children's program tonight, and thankful for you and your family coming up. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Adam and Kim are moving to Evansville. This is Stephanie, Kim's sister, and she's here for a few more days and then headed back to California. And so make sure you get to meet our visitors tonight. Make them feel welcome uh, before you leave the service this evening. Um, 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. Now, normally, we have, obviously, we have a 9.30 meeting for our visitation, and some of the men will probably go on visitation. Some are going to be able to stay. But if you can come and stay at 10 o'clock, we're going to have a men's prayer breakfast, and we're going to just take some time, number one, to eat, and that's going to be a great time. That There's always nothing wrong with eating, all right? So there's always good things there. It's going to be a great breakfast. Uh, the menu is good, and you'll enjoy that. Uh, but we're going to use this time as an opportunity just to have prayer with our men to take some time to share some things about the vision of our church and not exclusive things. They're not maybe uh, not new things that have never been talked about before, but just kind of talk about where we are right here in the middle of the year. We're trying to do something with our men once a quarter, and so this will be for this quarter, and we'll look forward to seeing you this Saturday at 10 a.m. If you could, and if you're coming to that, you've not signed up yet, if you could sign up in the lobby, and folks who are watching online, if you want to come to that, the men who are watching online, uh, then feel free to let us know. We just want to get a good head count so we know how many to prepare for. In a couple weeks, our teams are taking off. Actually, next week, uh, some of the teams are going on a trip. Some have won a, uh, a competition, uh, uh, something that the teams did there to kind of earn points and things like that. They're going on a, to a conference this week, next week, excuse me. Then the following week is the Shawnee Youth Conference, and so pray for them, and I know they're going to have a meeting this Sunday night after church. If you're looking around wondering where all the teens and young people are. Of course, we dismiss the kids, but the teens have their monthly teen service tonight, and so they are downstairs. Let me just say a couple quick things about Faith Music Radio, and then I'll sit down and we'll have our offering in just a moment. Um, first of all, we do have a summer fundraiser that's coming up. Our summer share is July the 28th and 29th, a two-day fundraiser, and we will have some information for you about that this Sunday. And we have a newsletter that's going to be going out, but we're going to give it to our church first, and so make sure that uh, you pray about that, pray for that, uh, and we can all be involved in the avenue of prayer if God lays on your heart to give something. That would be a tremendous help as to getting our, our radio ministry through the summer, and I know that'll be a blessing to that. And then in the month of August, actually, uh, we're talking about less than a month from today, we have a summer fun night that is planned at the Evansville Otters game, and we try to do this every year. Uh, we, we didn't do it, I don't know, did we do it last year, Brother Dan? The last couple years, COVID kind of threw us off, but we had been doing this every year prior to that, and uh, someone's going to throw out the first pitch, and it'll be a good time. I don't know what else we'll have, but we always take a big group. It's a family fun night, and for the supporters of our radio station you currently support, uh, you just need to go back and sign up. Uh, otherwise, the tickets are $10 a person, and it, it really is. It's a great night. It's a good night of fellowship and something that we can do in the summer just to kind of get together and hang out and also go out into the community and be a witness there. Uh, we usually have a little section that starts trouble, but we put that out real fast, okay, and we'll try to make sure that doesn't happen this year, and we're just going to pray it's not, that, not as hot on that night as it is today, okay? Main prayer request of the whole night, I think, is that one right there. So pray for those things if you would, and a lot of those things are coming up here really quickly, and we're going to be headed into the fall before you know it. So let's Let's continue to pray for these things. Well, let's turn to page number 373 and join us on The Sun is Coming Up in the Morning. Sing both verses to 373. Once again I face Satan this morning, and I battled him all the day long. But in my weakness, God's 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being in your house tonight. Lord, it's always refreshing to come in and get a refill on a Wednesday night. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. Thank you for salvation. Lord, we thank you for each one who came out on a very hot day. Lord, to be in your house, we ask that you bless them. Lord, we ask that you be with the young people downstairs, be with the teen church. We ask Heavenly Father, you be a pastor as he teaches and preaches to us, Lord, that you might empower him, that you might just fill him with your Holy Ghost, Lord, that we might be encouraged, Lord, we might be strengthened in our walk with you, and Lord, if there's one lost, that they might be saved. We ask Heavenly Father, you bless the offering, each gift, each giver, that may be used for your honor and glory here and throughout the world, for we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Brother David. Let's take our prayer page out, take a look on the inside tonight. By the way, I, ma I failed to mention the Staley's, the, the remnants of the Staley's, by the way. They, they kind of came in waves and not all together, but they're here tonight as well. They've just been here for about two weeks, and so forgive me for not recognizing you just a few moments ago, all right? Pray for tonight our missionary, Brother Charles Newton. Uh, as I said on the back, there is a prayer letter from him since that prayer letter has come in. Uh, you'll notice that uh, if you follow his, his Facebook updates or anything like that, that they have successfully planted their first church since the time uh, of the prayer letter that we provide you tonight. And so they have not sent a new prayer letter yet, but I wanted you to know that the ministry there is growing and it's exciting and the Lord is good and we are thankful to be able to support this family. Uh, pray for Charlie Reynolds tonight and he is recovering from back surgery that he had today. And this is a, a, a kind of a corrective surgery. And, of course, we continue along those lines to pray for Anne Michelle 
and she is doing better. I talked to Brother James right before the service. We're seeing some improvement, and more than likely watching us tonight, if she is, we want you to know we're praying for you. Uh, we need to pray for our, of course, our ministry needs over on the other page there. Uh, pray for our summer youth conferences that we have coming up over the next couple of weeks. And we're thankful our teens be, are able to go and be a part of these programs. Uh, if you would pray for the uh, conference next week and the one following that. And so they're kind of back to back. Uh, two weeks from now, I will be with them in Louisville, Kentucky, and I get to lead music for that conference at the Shawnee Baptist Church usually every year, and so you pray for us as we go over there for that meeting, and I know it'll be a blessing to our teenagers and a help to our youth group and our church as a whole. Um, we're praying for a lot of different things. I want to encourage you to pray for our Indiana state legislators right now. They are in caucus discussing all things pro-life, uh, abortion laws, all those things. I've been in touch today with one of our representatives who said that when the session comes back in at the end of the month was when they'll have to vote on those things, but they're discussing them all right now. And uh, let me just say this, we need to pray for our leaders. Uh, we talked about that on Romans, uh, Romans 13 on Sunday morning. We need to pray for them that they will rule with a godly, uh, a godly wisdom, and we need to ask God to give that to them and impress that upon them. And so let's ask God to do that tonight. We're going to take just a couple of minutes right here in the middle of the service to go to prayer. Brother David, if you'll play for us. The altar is open tonight as he plays this evening. Let's take time to pray and find someone to pray with if you would like here for just the next few moments. We'll close in prayer and continue with the service in just a moment. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you tonight for your blessing. Thank you for the opportunity that we have as a church body to assemble here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Lord, help us not to take for granted the preaching that we get from your word. And Lord, with that request, I pray that you'd be with our pastor as he speaks tonight, that you'd fill him with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you'd meet his needs, the needs of him and his family. Lord, we do pray for his family while they're traveling and away. Father, I also pray that you would be with our country, Lord, that you would send us the revival that we desperately need, that we're lacking. Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom in these areas where we can be salt and light, and Lord, help us to be a testimony. Lord, I pray that people would be saved this week. Lord, I thank you for those that have followed the Lord in baptism these many weeks in a row here at Faithway, and maybe not all, but Lord, so many, and we thank you for that. 
But Lord, we pray that souls will be saved. Lord, I pray for Brother Charlie tonight as he's recovering from his surgery. And Lord, that you'd be with him. And thank you for this good family, this good husband and wife. And Lord, I pray that you'd meet their needs. Lord, for our missionaries that are on the field. And Lord, we thank for uh, Brother Newton tonight. And Lord, I pray that you'll meet his needs. Lord, we pray for safety for all of our missionaries. Some in situations that are more in need of your physical safety and others that just have just have needs. Lord, I pray that you'll meet their needs. Lord, I pray that you give them souls for their hire. Lord, I do thank you for what you're doing here at Faithway Baptist Church. And Lord, may you grant us your wisdom from above. Lord, we need it so much. We depend upon you. We love you tonight. And thank you for how you've loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, I'd like for you to take your song books. We're going to sing a couple of verses of this song right before the message tonight. It's page number 413. And uh, I believe we have the first and last verse there. It's 413. Fill my cup, Lord. Like the woman at the well I was seeking For things that could not satisfy And then I heard my Savior speaking Draw from my well that never shall run dry Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me all. So my brother, if the things this world gave you, leave hungers that won't pass away. My blessed Lord will come and save you If you kneel to him and humbly pray Fill my cup, Lord Cup, Lord Come and quench this thirsting of my soul Bread of heaven, feed me till Good singing tonight. Let's take our Bibles, go to 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter tonight, if you would. And we're going to start a new series that I think, and I, I say I think because I don't know, but I believe that would be a, maybe a more appropriate word, will take us through to the end of the year, and we'll take this uh, as we have. Now, I, I want to cover something first before we go into this. And the first thing is, is you might be asking, why did we cover 2 Peter before we covered 1 Peter this year? And that is a good question to which I do not have a good answer. I'm just going to be honest with you. We've already gone all the way through the book of 2 Peter, uh, through the letter, and I enjoyed every minute of it. I guess the only thing I can say is that I felt very strongly that we needed to be where we were when we were there. And now we're moving backwards, and we're going to go in reverse a little bit. But I think the contrast uh, between the two, and I think some of the similarities between the two, will really help our church. I don't think that in any way this is going to be like going back and reviewing. Uh, I think it's just going to be helpful. And so we're going to begin in First Peter tonight. There are, in the New Testament, three predominant authors. There are many more. There are others, I should say, beyond the three. But if you were to look at the writings of the New Testament, you would notice that most of the books, especially after you get past the book of Acts, who would you say is the most predominant author of those, of those letters? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul had a major theme. Now, let me just say that I'm going to ascribe a theme to each of these authors, these human authors that God used. He breathed the words to them. They wrote the words down. We have them today in God's preserved word. We're thankful for that. But I'm going to ascribe these themes, but I want you to understand that all of the authors really covered the themes that the other ones did as well. You'll just find that they're a little bit more obvious with some. So I think if we could break all of the Apostle Paul's writings down, we would say that he emphasized very heavily something called faith. He, he wrote a lot about faith. He in, increased in faith as he served the Lord. 
Uh, it always seemed like he was emphasizing believing God for something more and going the extra mile. That was his life. That was his, that was his, uh, his motto, if you will, is just step out by faith. Then you have the Apostle John. And, of course, John's main theme, the main theme of his life and his writings is the theme of love. We talked about that in Romans 13 this past Sunday, is that we are supposed to be known, as Jesus said these words, he said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John was known to encourage people to love. And by the way, this is one who was known as one of the sons of thunder. Okay, he was not a soft, uh, effeminate individual. I think he was probably very decisive. I think he was probably very, uh, very motivated. But yet he was a very loving person. And I want us to think about this is that when we walk in the spirit of God, God is going to encourage us. God's going to help us. And God's going to strengthen us in areas that we did not have when we were walking in our flesh. That's how someone who, and by the way, I I know of of people in our church like this. I don't want to embarrass you tonight. I'm not going to call your name. But there were, were some of you who before Christ, you were not one thing and now you are by the grace of God. Whether that means that maybe you were angry before, but now you have a tender heart, or uh, you were bitter before, but now you're very, uh, very open and transparent. I mean, God changes all of that. And that was the story of John. He writes about love. And then you have the Apostle Peter. And in this book especially, and all throughout his, his writings, both of the letters that he wrote, his primary theme was that of hope. So think about this. You've got the three main authors, and what do they cover? Faith hope and love, faith, hope, and charity. Isn't that pretty cool to see that and just to kind of see that as we go through this? We're going to see in the life or in the writing, rather, of the Apostle Peter that we have great hope in Christ. Now, I want you to look with me, if you would, and see verse number 8. We're just going to find ourselves in verse 8 tonight of chapter 1. And what I'm going to do this evening is give you an overview. We're going to start tonight. We'll give an overview. We will come back and cover some of the information of the overview once we get to uh, certain aspects or certain parts of the book. But let's look at verse number 8 for just a moment, if, if you would. It says, Whom having not seen, who are we talking about? We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love, the Bible says. So we, we cannot see Christ with our physical eyes, but the Bible says we are to love him. And we are to love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. And every aspect of our being is supposed to be dedicated to loving God. Why is that? Because he first, what? Loved us. And it says, whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice, notice this, with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Isn't that a great verse in Scripture? It says that because we love God, because we trust Jesus, because no matter what may come, we can endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and we can also lay everything at his feet and know he'll never fail us. The Bible says we experience something that the rest of the world cannot experience, and it's worded so beautifully in the Bible. It's called joy unspeakable and full of glory. Have you ever been so happy you didn't know how to describe your happiness? Have you ever, not tonight, I can tell, okay. (laughs) Have you ever just been so overwhelmed with joy that you could not put it into words? It was such that it was overwhelming to you, it was surprising. Maybe someone that you didn't expect came and did something super nice for you, all right? Maybe, maybe Brother Ted bought me a brand new gun or something like that. I mean, that would be joy unspeakable. I, didn't, I wouldn't expect that from him, but if he did, no. I'm just... Maybe somebody does something really nice for you, and you just don't know what to say. Do you know that living in the love of God is like being so happy that all the time, that you just don't know how to describe it. Now, we're going to talk tonight about an overview of First Peter. We're going to discuss what are the main thrusts and themes of what he's going to discuss with us and what he's going to talk to us about and how God's going to minister to us through this. And we're going to see all of those different things. And it's, I really believe, going to be helpful. But what we need to know immediately is that these people who have joy unspeakable and full of glory were suffering in ways that you and I cannot relate to. They were persecuted. 
They were, they were in, many, in many cases in hiding. They were scattered. If you read the commentaries on 1 Peter, this was, the, this was the dispersed church is what they might say. They had been scattered abroad because persecution had come to Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. So that's why in verse 1, if you look at that with me for just a moment, it says that Peter's an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, or Bithynia. With all of this, we see some of what God is trying to show us here. We, we have to connect it by understanding a little bit of who wrote it, who it was written to, and what it means to us today. I heard someone tell me uh, a long time ago, they said, if you want to know how to communicate a message to somebody, then you do three things every time. You tell them what you're going to say, and then you say it, and then you tell them what you just said. So you're going to, tonight, we're going to tell you what we're going to say, and we're going to take this opportunity to talk about the entire book, and so we won't necessarily end up going verse by verse tonight, but that's what we'll end up doing, uh, Lord willing, starting next week. So tonight, let's just get a a firm grasp on the overview. First of all, who is the author? The author is the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter is clearly the leader of Christ's disciples, those who are with Jesus, the 12 or the 11, if you discount Judas. Probably he wrote this in about AD 65, which would be toward the end of the Apostle Peter's life. Peter is one of the more out front characters of scripture. And that, I think, goes for both the Old Testament and the New. The Old Testament, you have a lot of foundational characters. In the New Testament, you have some people uh, like the Apostle Peter who occasionally, if we could phrase it this way, they steal the limelight just a little bit. They, They attract the attention of the reader because their name and their face is always popping up in some story somewhere. We know a lot about Simon Peter's personal life from the three years that he spent with Jesus. And of course, we know his temperament, because if you were to study the life of Peter, you would say, I might relate to Simon Peter just a little bit. He was very headstrong. He was very stubborn. Uh, He was very outspoken. He was very much the one who would speak first and ask questions later. And of course, Jesus, uh, in one chapter's time, we see Jesus commending him because he said, flesh and blood hath not revealed this to thee, but my Father, which art in heaven. And then in, in just a few verses, he looks at him and says, get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, you don't want that that nickname from Jesus, but that's what Simon Peter got. And so that's the kind of person that he is. God does a work in his life. And we see that after, uh, after Pentecost, we see that now he takes a little bit more of a backseat to the Apostle Paul as far as the emphasis. And why was that? Well, it wasn't because the Apostle Paul was any greater than the Apostle Peter. Uh, it was because the Apostle Paul was instrumental in being what was known as the Apostle to the Gentiles. So Jesus revealed himself personally to the Jews, and he shows up, he uh, lives a perfect life, he does all the miracles there, and of course, uh, even when he, when he meets the, uh, the occasional Gentile, in one case especially, uh, he said, listen, uh, I'm not come to minister to you. Now, he was there to minister to everybody, but he came first to the household of Israel. And all of his disciples that followed him would have, I believe, without the moving of the Holy Spirit and then the ministry of the Apostle Paul, of course, also moved by the Holy Spirit, they would have kept that there. It would have stayed with the Jews. It would have stayed with Israel. But that was never God's plan. And and we see that from prior to the, the coming of Christ. I mean, prophecy in the Old Testament says that the gospel was to be to all men, Jew and Greek, Jew and Gentile alike. And so the Apostle Paul takes a little bit more of an out front uh, position in front of the Apostle Peter. However, that doesn't mean that Peter's ministry was any less active than it was on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, Simon Peter stands before the people. He preaches. Thousands are converted. And we see God doing a great work through him who just a few days prior, if you will, in the grand scheme of things, was cursing Jesus at the foot of the cross or in Jesus, uh, when Jesus was being tortured and, and tried. Peter and Paul served with some of the same people. At the end of this book, in chapter 5, verse 12, he talks about the book being written by the hand of Silvanus. Now, there's a couple of reasons that's important. Number one, Silvanus is Silas. That's who that is. So Paul and Silas, you know that 
Paul would serve with Silas. Sometimes he would serve with someone and send them on the way, and then uh, someone else would. And so there's actually a lot of overlap between the ministry of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. And then it also says it was written by the hand of Silvanus. The reason that that's actually somewhat important is because uh, there is there's a lot of doubt that's cast upon 1st and 2nd Peter as to whether or not it should be included in the Scripture. Is it part of God's inspired Word? And one of the reasons they say that this could not have been done is because it was written in formal Greek. And they say, well, if Peter was just an uneducated fisherman, then there's no way he would have been able to do that. And I think it's important to know that, first of all, he may not have been a scholar, but he was not completely uneducated. And then also it shows that someone else took the words and penned them. Has anybody ever written something on the back of an envelope and given it to somebody else to fill in all the punctuation, given it to a secretary, that kind of thing? Uh, this, is, this is 100% a valid portion of the Word of God is the point that I'm making tonight. And so the Apostle Peter is the author. Uh, his life is an interesting life. He is a disciple whose life can be an inspiration to us as disciples of Christ. And I read one thing today that I had not read before uh, as I was preparing just to finish up tonight. Um, tradition holds that the Apostle Peter was crucified upside down on a cross. That's not written in the Bible. That's, that's a historical writing. That's a traditional writing. But what I did not know is that tradition also teaches that he was also forced to watch them crucify his wife before they crucified him. And the reading that I found on that said, the only thing it said about it was that it happened, and that he encouraged his wife with these words, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. If that's the case, what a tremendous testimony and what an inspiration to all of us tonight. The audience to whom this book is written, this letter is written, are the Christians who are referred to here in verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The next word says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God and the Father. Now, first of all, these are all, the recipients of this letter are all believers. So they're saved. They've been saved. They're probably baptized members of a church. But why does he call them strangers? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. These are the five regions of Asia Minor, the same crowd to whom he wrote his second letter a little bit later on, and we can go into some of the differences, contrasts, comparisons, if you will, of the two letters at a later time. But it seems very likely that the recipients of this letter were actually Jewish Christians who were now living in Asia Minor. Now, of course, it would not have been wrong for someone who was not a Jew to have read this. I don't think that it was restricted to that, but it's, it's kind of indicated in this passage, and it's believed by a lot of people who've studied this out that he did not know with a firsthand knowledge the people to whom he was writing this letter. Now, the Apostle Paul often wrote to people very specifically. And he said, I remember you, and I remember your face, and I remember your name, and, and greet this person, and, and pray for this guy. And, and it was just a little bit different. But here he says, I'm writing this to strangers. I'm just trying to encourage all the believers to know that you have hope in Jesus no matter how hard and how difficult your Christian life becomes. What would have been so difficult, and we've talked about this before in many settings, but it would have been difficult for anyone in that day to have lived the kind of Christian life that you and I now live openly because we do not face resistance and persecution like they would have faced it. He said, well, you know, someone made fun of me at work for being a Christian, and, and uh, I've stopped carrying my Bible. Look, it was a lot worse for them than just carrying a Bible to church. It, it was, they would lose their job. They would be disowned from their own families. They would be cast aside as uh, people of society that, that no one should speak to and no one should ever talk to. And, and let me just say tonight that if that were to happen to this church or the church as a whole, uh, you, would, you would really find out who your true friends are. You say, well, how was the church, the early church, the first century church, how was it that they had all things common, that they always had unity? How was it that they were always together? Well, you usually find unity and all things common and a bond and a closeness in a church when they're going through a difficult time. In this case, it would have been persecution. So the author is Simon Peter, the 
audience are the strangers, perhaps people he did not even know other than those he specifically mentioned, who had been scattered abroad by the persecution at Jerusalem and Israel and all of those areas that the church had really grown and developed after Pentecost. And now he's coming down to the end of his life. He says, I want to write to you my first letter. And he outlines it with three specific things. Really, you could make a case for four. So the first one is this, is that the first several chapter, or several verses, excuse me, of chapter one deal with the salvation of the believer, the salvation of the believer. We don't have time to look at it all, but look at verse two, if you would, of chapter one. It says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now, in the next few verses, and I want to take much more time in future weeks to go over these verses with you, but in the next few verses, he spends a good amount of space in his letter belaboring the finer points of their salvation. That's very important. And it matters because when you and I read the Bible, we have the whole book. It's done. There are no more revelations to be had outside of what God has given us in his word. Uh, This is it. They didn't have that. I mean, this is being written in real time to the people that would eventually receive this letter. And at the beginning of a lot, not, not all, But a lot of the letters that were written to the churches, especially those written by Peter and Paul, you find the first several verses acknowledging one thing, obviously the author. Uh, Two, you would see that they acknowledge to whom they are writing, and always, if it's written to the church, it's to believers. And generally speaking, you would see them really spend a few verses at the beginning of every book, or every letter rather, talking about how good their salvation is. Now, you and I read these verses, and it's easy to get bored and think, well, it's the same thing in 1 Peter as it is in 2 Peter, and it looks the same as what some of Paul wrote, and and you and I could take in 20 minutes' time, we could read five or six chapters and probably see some repeated things, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I find myself just reading just to read. Anybody else find yourself there? Okay, nobody? Good. You all are so much better Christians than I am tonight. I do. I just, I read it and I go, okay, okay, okay. And then I go, wait a minute, I didn't get anything out of that. I have to go back and look at it. But what strikes me initially about the writings of these New Testament authors, if you will, as God gave them the the word, is how they often establish the doctrinal premise of the gospel or their salvation, if we could put it that way. Now, it may sound repetitive, And you may think, did they not understand salvation? Were they ignorant of the finer points of that? Are we more enlightened than they are? But I want to challenge you to let this shape your thinking as we read through this. The early church was not ignorant of their salvation. They were overwhelmed by it. Did you hear what I said tonight? The early church was not ignorant of their salvation. They were enthralled by it. They were amazed by it. They were overwhelmed by it. And I think that emotion... If I can use that word in church, in a Baptist church, I think that emotion is lacking among Christians today. I think that sometimes it's lacking in my own life in a big way. Because quite frankly, we, we sing songs about our salvation. We read verses about our salvation. We talk about being saved. We, we get up and make an announcement or two about so-and-so received Christ this past week. And, and every time someone stirs the waters, the baptistry behind us, we say this is them uh, following their salvation with a public profession and a commitment to walk with God. And, and we applaud. And then we go about our way. And honestly, I think we forget. And I think we just move on real quick because the game is on or lunch is in the crock pot or something else is going on, and I've got too many problems and too many other distractions and too many other things to think about than what Jesus did for me when he died on the cross and was buried and rose again. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying tonight? Yeah, we don't, we take it for granted. We don't take it seriously, the fact that Jesus saved our soul. You see, what's going to happen when we get enthralled and overwhelmed with our salvation again is we're going to have something called joy unspeakable and full of glory. You say, well, to be honest with you, I'm just not very happy. I mean, I'm saved, and I know that God is good, and, and I know these things in my head, but I'm just going to be honest with you. I've, 
I'm just kind of lethargic. I'm just a little bit apathetic. I'm not seeing a lot of progress. I've got this big problem over here, and it's really burdening me, and it's keeping me from enjoying my salvation. I want you to pause and compare yourself for just a moment to the fact that these who had joy unspeakable and full of glory could have at any time lost their head for their faith. It really separates the men from the boys. It, it really separates out the kind of Christianity that was in Peter and the early church versus the commercial brand of Christianity that we see today. And you say, well, what am I talking about? Well, I mean, just about any concert, they'll sing a song laced with profanity and the very next minute say, well, I, I thank God. Let's sing this song, this hymn. Let, let's sing. Have you ever noticed that? And we think, oh, look at that. That's great. That, that, that person out there, is, he's, he's modeling Christianity. No, he's not. You know why? Because that kind of Christianity is not based on the gospel. It doesn't matter, by the way, if you think it is. It doesn't matter if you say it is. If you don't understand what the gospel is, that Christ died for your sins and rose again, and is, by the way, hey, listen, is coming back one day. If our Christianity is not based on that, then that may explain why we don't have joy. That may explain why we don't have what we need from God to get us through. Nehemiah was the one who said the joy of the Lord is our strength, and I guess that explains why we're weak sometimes, because we don't have the joy of the Lord. Now, this alone separates out the kind of Christianity held by Peter, the early church. You see, everything that we learn from this point on and over the course of the next several weeks is based on the fact that, number one, we are saved, and number two, the gospel is still working in us. So let me just encourage you, don't get bored when we revisit the concept of salvation over and over and over again at Faithway Baptist Church in our services. Don't get bored with the fact that pastor's talking about the gospel again. And sometimes we've got to get past the idea that, well, he's sharing that because he knows someone here is lost and they need to hear the gospel. Maybe we just ought to share the gospel story again so we can rejoice in it, so that we can glory in the cross because it's essential to our joy. So once we have found the doctrinal foundation of our salvation, then Simon Peter goes through and he discusses the second point, which is the submission of the believer. You say, well, where does that word come in? Go to chapter 2 and verse 13, if you would. And it says in verse 13 here, and we won't, again, we won't go through all these, I'll just mention them, but I'll show you a couple of times where this word comes up. It says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Again, this resonates with what we talked about in Romans 14. And for the praise of them that do well. Uh, in verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all fear. Uh, in ver chapter 3, it talks about being in subjection in the home and in marriage. And then later on in the chapter, it says that we need to have compassion one another. We need to submit ourselves one to another. Now, once you have a doctrinal foundation, you can now receive practical exhortation, practical instruction, if you will. A lot of times we want to get to the nuts and bolts of things. We want to get to the how-tos because that's, that's what's going to make our life better. But the Bible doesn't start with the how-tos. It start, starts with why. Why do we believe? Why, why are we here on a Wednesday night when it's 1,000 degrees outside? I'm sorry, 1,002 degrees outside. It's hot. It was 1,000 degrees a couple weeks ago. I mean, why are we here? Why are, I mean, surely we're, just, we're, we're, we're not that committed. Yes, we are. Because we need to get something from this in order for our lives to matter. And if we're going to get something from it, we got to know what the doctrine of God's Word says so that we can get to the practical living out of that. And most of the Christian life can be summed up in one word, and that is submit. Yeah, that's, that's a tough word to, to really buy into because it means that I have to put my stubbornness and my will aside and ultimately, the Bible says we're to submit ourselves unto the Lord. But when we submit to God, you are very quickly going to find that there are a whole lot of other people that you have to submit to as well. You say, well, that just sounds authoritarian. No, if you read it for what it says, it's godliness. It's godliness. So we are to submit to government as God commands us. We're to submit to our masters or employers. We're to submit in marriage. We're to submit one to another. And then lastly, it gets to this final point, and this is where we sum it all up, and really, this is where it all comes together. 
Because ultimately, the letter of First Peter was written to encourage people in their suffering. This book deals in a big way with what it looks like for a Christian to suffer. A couple of statements for you tonight. Trials that result from our loyalty to Jesus are inevitable. They are inevitable. Jesus told us this. He said, if they hated me, they will hate you. It happened, persecution happened to every one of Jesus' closest followers. Read the stories. Even Thomas, who was a doubter, we believe was martyred for his faith in India. Simon Peter, crucified upside down on a cross. John, boiled in oil. James, beheaded. And on and on and on, the Apostle Paul, the same. Trials resulting from a loyalty to Christ will take place. What's often confusing in the immediate is the question we all ask, which is usually this, God, if I'm doing what you want me to do, then why does it hurt? If I'm doing what you asked me to do, then why am I suffering? This is where we have to read the Bible and understand that two things can be true at the same time. For instance, God is a God of love and he's a God of judgment. Those two things are true at the same time. In this case, God is a faithful God who is always with you. He will never leave, you, leave thee nor forsake thee. He will never be unfaithful to you, and yet you will have to suffer. You, as a matter of fact, let's just, let's just establish this at the very beginning. If you want to be used of God, you will suffer. You have to. Because not only is God a faithful God, he is also a refining fire. And God wants to both use us and purge us at the same time. That's why we suffer. There may be times when, and this is a very delicate thing to say, even more delicate to practice. There may be times when God wants us to suffer and serve him more at the same time. I'm not talking about signing up for a volunteer list at the church. I'm talking about God fulfilling his will for your life. He oftentimes does that when things around you are the most chaotic. I've not, I've not experienced horrendous suffering in my life. I don't claim that. Many of you could tell stories, and we're not here for comparison's sake, but I just want you to know before I say what I'm going to say that I understand that I have some things yet to go through. I mean, we've all been through some things, myself included. But every time that God has elevated, and I'm talking about we humble ourselves and God lifts us up, biblically speaking, any time God has elevated, whether it be my ministry, the ministry of my immediate family, the ministry of our church, any time that's happened, it has always been accompanied by immense pressure. We could say suffering. How many people respond, or how, I'll say that with the right tone, how many people respond to suffering is to limit their serving. But God says if you want to serve more effectively, you have to suffer. We're going to see that in this, and, and we'll learn several things. First of all, he teaches us how to behave in our suffering. <clears throat> I don't know if you have ever broken a pinky in the pinky toe in the middle of the night by walking across the room and kicking the side of the door, but I have. And can I tell you, I'm glad my wife was the only one there to see it. You know why? Because I make quite a scene usually when I'm hurting. I go, oh man, and oh, you know, everybody's, everybody's waiting for the pastor to say something he's not supposed to say or something, you know. What am I saying? Look, there is a particular conduct God expects from us when we're hurting, when we're suffering. And, and he says in chapter 3, verse 13, he says, but, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. 
I have never stepped on a Lego in the middle of the night and said, praise the Lord. I've not done that, but I'll tell you what, in life, sometimes we, we have things that hurt us, that shake our world. And the Bible says if it's for righteousness' sake, we can be happy. So God gives us a conduct in this book. He teaches us who the example is. He says, for Christ hath also suffered for sins. You see, Jesus is the ultimate in suffering. No one suffered more than Jesus. At the moment that my sin was placed on his holy shoulders, and your sin was placed on his holy sinless life, the physical suffering alone, we, we have nothing to compare it to of the crucifixion. But the spiritual suffering of a perfect God taking sin and becoming sin, he who knew no sin became sin, the Bible says, that's suffering. So there's a conduct that is, that is becoming of a Christian who's going through something. There's also an example that we have to follow. In chapter 4, there's also some things to remember when you're suffering. And those would be, for instance, remembering to love one another when you're hurting. Uh, love one another with a pure heart fervently, I believe it says. And then it finally teaches us in chapter 5, how do we serve while we're suffering? You see, one of the things that we have to accept about our existence, that's whether you're saved or lost, is that it's hard either way. It's difficult either way. If you want to go out and live a life apart from Christ and tell me that it's not hard, you'd be a liar. Because the way of the transgressor is hard. And to serve Jesus and to suffer for Jesus, yes, it's difficult. The Apostle Paul said we have to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But the difference is in how we walk through the valley of suffering. And so this letter, it makes a big to-do about salvation. It teaches us all about it, and it tells us a lot of things that I can't wait to dive into. I mean, we're just, we're just going to park wherever we park on this and just spend as much time as we have to in the first portion of this letter. And then we've got to embrace the reality that, that living for Christ is submitting. It's, it's lowering ourselves. It's, it's decreasing and diminishing so that Jesus can be exalted and glorified in our lives. And then when we suffer... Jesus said, it is impossible, but that offenses should come. When we suffer, be prepared. I think of, if the, if the account is true, I think of Simon Peter looking at his crucified wife and saying, remember the Lord? I mean, we read of men like Polycarp. We read of men like Tyndale and others who were burned at the stake. I mean, it's an amazing thing to consider, isn't it, that we have not had that kind of issue in our nation ever, not to that degree. But a Christian has to ask always, they have to ask themselves always, what would I do? What would I do? I, I'm, I'm actually excited for some of our teenagers to hear us go through this study together. Because I'm, af I'm afraid if we're not careful when we teach, what we teach in Sunday school is we teach such an elementary level, and I'm, this is fine that we teach these stories, don't get me wrong, I'm not against anything we're teaching in our Sunday school classes, but sometimes it's what we don't teach. And that is that, hey, you are going to have some difficulty in your life because of your faith. I mean, how many of you grew up in Sunday school and got to a certain point and life just hits you upside the head and went, I never saw that coming? I want our teenagers to know. I want them to have that mentality. I want my children to have that thought process of, what if I had to give myself for Jesus? You say, Pastor, you're sounding awful radical. No more radical than what was expected of Christ's closest followers. So as we look at this together, we see who it is that wrote the book. We see to whom the book was written. We see why it was written, the instruction that was given. And we leave tonight, I hope, a little more hungry for what we're going to see in this. I would encourage you, as I always do when we start something out, 
Take some time. This is five chapters. If I take my Bible, it's just three pages, three full pages and a couple half pages. I mean, it's not very much. If you were to read this every day, all five chapters, I think it'd take you 10 minutes, even if you read it slow. And if you would, for a week or so, you just do whatever the Lord leads you to do. Maybe you would read it through once a day. Maybe you might put it in the background. You can listen to audio Bible now and just put it there and, and let, it, let it go in your ears. I, I've gotten a lot by doing that. Whatever the case may be, try to put this in you before we get to the study so that you're seeing things and, and you're marking things down and you're saying, I can't wait till we get to that point. Maybe you'll see something I won't see. And if that be the case, we'll give God all the glory for that. But take some time, increase your study of this book, read through it, Write down questions, whatever you need to do, and let's go through this together as a church, and let's see if God will bless it, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for how you have taught us even tonight, and Lord, this has been very much an overview, a bird's eye view of where we're headed, but Lord, I just pray that you'd please give us clarity in the, in the details of this text as we go through it. Lord, thank you for how you can teach us and how there's always more truth to be seen. There's always something else there, and Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see what you have for us only. Uh, limit us from being distracted, Lord. Help us to be faithful in our study of it and in our, uh, our time together. Lord, help us not to neglect the assembling together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as we see the day approaching. And Lord, thank you for this good crowd here tonight, those who are watching online. And Lord, we think of our shut-ins tonight. We always have them on our prayer list, but I want to bring them up to you now and ask that you would strengthen many of them this evening and help them as they're able to hear these words spoken through the live stream and uh, I pray that you'd bless them through that as well. God, help us to have a wonderful week, and help us, Lord, as we follow you. Help us to listen to your voice. Help us to hear when you lead us with your spirit. Help us to be sensitive to your guidance the rest of this week, and may we come back together rejoicing on Sunday. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One quick reminder before you leave, men, signed up for the men's breakfast, if you would. God bless you. Let's stand together. We are dismissed tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm.